amazed to see this many people at this time of the hour in the morning. That's <laughs> uh, for the forum that, that we have going. So again, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Bob Burney, CEO of Film Distribution Company Apparition, has been a stalwart of the independent film world for more than two decades. In 2009, he formed his present company with producer Bill Polak. Before that, Bob headed Picture House, a theatrical distribution and production company. Um, Bob came to Picture House from New Market Films, where, as co-founder, he managed the release of such films as Mel Gibson's box office film, The Passion of Christ, which earned more than $370 million. How many of you actually saw that? <laughs> Bob's career in film began back in college. He studied film history and production at the University of Texas in Austin and worked as a projectionist for the AMC theater chain. After graduating with a BA in the communications, Bernie bought and renovated the Inwood Theater in Dallas, which he opened as an art house venue, complete with a martini bar. <laughs> <laughs> there, he booked his favorite foreign and independent film. That's where I fell in love with the film, he said. Uh, at that time, showing art and independent films in Dallas was a public service, and people of the city were truly grateful. Bob is fortunate that his love of film is shared by his wife and partner, Jeannie Burney, She's a key part of the team and operation as executive VP, heading up all marketing and publicity. Previously, she was director of PR and marketing at Film Society of Lincoln Center, where she created the marketing department and managed many star-studded events, including tributes to Meryl Streep, Diane Keaton, and Jessica Lange. The Bernie's extensive experience of the independent film business has paid off in a highly successful first year for their new venture. <coughs> they have overseen the release of a slate of critically acclaimed and award-winning films, including Jane Campion's Bright Star, The Young Victoria, which won an Oscar for Best Costume Design. Their newest release, The Runaways, stars Kristen Stewart and Dakota Fanning and is showing around town now. Bob and Jeannie live in Bronzeville with their two sons, they serve on the Pelham Picture House Advisory Committee, and Jeannie was on the auction committee for the highly successful Lawrence Hospital Gala last year. And Paul, we know where we can go for the next uh, fundraiser. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Really, it, it is a pleasure. They're neighbors, and, and it's welcome uh, to, to our home. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, well, uh, Jeannie, as I said, uh, Jeannie and I have worked in the film business since the early days of independent film, um, which is it's become kind of a brand. Um. Can I, before you know, independent even became a business, this sort of sector of um, films made with independent money and put out in theaters through people like us has gone through many cycles over the last 25 years. We really started, though, in the business because we love movies. From the, from the, when he mentioned starting the theater, which he didn't mention, that's where I also met Jeannie at the theater. So she, she was a customer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, uh, uh, but distribution, what we do, distribution, is really a way to connect filmmakers and audiences. So that's, that, that, that's, what's the, that's the fun part about it. It can be a great business as well, but it's a delicate art of kind of balancing the art side and the business side. Um, we're always walking that line. It, it, you cross over either, either way and you kind of fall off. But it's, it's been a real uh, fun kind of trip to watch the business through its up and down cycles. Uh, and just to kind of uh, hopefully give you an idea of our, our world from where we started, I just want to show a, a clip of some of the films we've worked on you know, in the past. So we'll turn that on. Let's see. Okay. And, we, and a lot of a lot of these films uh, have a lot of New Yorkers in it. We've re I've realized looking back at it now. As you'll see, starting with, I think Steve Buscemi here. <laughs> Welcome 
is not about to get popped. It is getting popped. Where did the universe come from? And where is it going? I shall answer the wall. Yeah, I have to. You have too much control over my life. You got a dog. Read your mind. I can't imagine. show some more of our current stuff later, but um, with films like Memento and Pan's Labyrinth and Greek Wedding and The Passion, those, those are the still number one and two grossing independent films ever. Um, we experienced a change in how 
the independent films were perceived in the, in the film business. Companies like the original Miramax uh, altered the perception, I think, of, and viability of this kind of film uh, with aggressive marketing campaigns and, and a real business developed over the years. Um, the, the success of many of these films and the companies caught the attention of the Hollywood studios and many of them bought or started their own indie divisions. Sure. Disney bought Miramax, Universal bought Good Machine and formed Focus Features. Um, Fox, Fo Fox closed Fox Classics but opened Searchlight, which has had many huge movies. Paramount created Paramount Classics and then Vantage. New Line and HBO bought our former company, New Market Films, and created picture house. So there was a whole consolidation of this business, part of the cycle. Definitely the, the studios saw the success, particularly in um, you know the big movies that jumped out. They didn't really notice all the smaller independent films that and how hard it is to, to gross one million dollars or any money. But everyone kind of bought into it and followed and all the studios suddenly wanted to have their own division. It's a little bit of the Hollywood style where everybody, if one studio does it, they all have to do it. So it's like, what do you mean we don't have independent film division? You know, start one tomorrow. And it was a lot of times easier to, to, to buy one. Uh, part of this success was driven by the DVD uh, sales phenomenon over the years where studios could recycle old films and, and DVDs were really a cash machine. Uh, and that was really booming through the 90s until four or five years, years ago. And part of it is driven by the hope of an inexpensive film suddenly breaking through as all the Hollywood films are so expensive on, on the budget level. And the other part was driven by the prestige of the awards. At the end of the Academy Awards season, all of a sudden all the independent films were the ones winning the awards. And that was kind of a change, you know, it had always been dominated by the studios, the Academy Awards run by the MPAA, which has six members, which are the studios. And, you know, I think you really have to give Harvey Weinstein the credit for starting to take these small films and take them all the way through the Oscars. And, of course, all of us were doing that. And as we were trying to think of a good example in that time in 2003, we happened to see a small film that everybody had kind of written off as a genre film. And we saw in that film a huge Academy Award performance by Charlize Theron. That was Monster, which you saw the clip for. So we took a film that everybody had dismissed that was a little tough to watch. She played a prostitute. She played a real life person who was in prison. And it was uh, portrayed in the feature. We actually opened that movie on Christmas Eve, <laughs> kind of counter-programming, but it worked. A lot of people really went to see the movie, and then we kept it in theaters during that critical voting period, and that did two things. It helped us to continue to generate profit on the movie, and it built the foundation of a campaign that garnered her a Best Actress Award. It always, it always helps when you have this, uh, uh, Hollywood loves it when you have the beautiful actress, you know, gain a lot of weight and, 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 yeah. and make, you know, and look terrible, you know, as a killer. <laughs> or, but she really deserved it. it, was, it, was, it was, and, but we also noticed in the independent side, the actors really, uh, if, if they're smart, they really get on the team and help support the film, where it's the opposite of, uh, usually what you hear about when the actors have the entourage and demand this and that when they're in a studio film. In this case, Charlize realized it was a low-budget film and she would go around, we had to go around and meet the theater owners and shake hands and she had to meet every one of them and go, you know, literally carry the film around. And she, and I think that's why um, she won. I mean, I think people, the Academy voters and everything, li they like the performance, but they also like the fact that somebody really, you know, sort of wants it and, and talks to him. At that same year, and we had Whale Rider out in the previous summer, and um, it, we, had, we were also nominated, the, I don't know if you saw the film, it's a great New Zealand family film. And the yeah, little, how many did see, see Whale, Whale Rider? Rider. Yeah, so the, the little girl, Keisha Cashel Hughes, <coughs> ended up being nominated for Best Actress that same year, which we were, we were just shocked, uh, mm -hmm. Governor Edge, we, we'd actually put her forward as supporting and the Academy just decides whichever they want. So we had, it was really great, we had Keisha and Charlize 
that year, both up <clears throat> as a new company, and uh, you know, all of a sudden we had competing actresses. You know, but it, <laughs> but it was great because um, Charlize was so nice to Keisha and sort of helped her through the process. And was for for Keisha coming, literally, she came was picked out of a school, uh, Aborigine, ab, you know, Maori school, excuse me, in in New Zealand, and all of a sudden she was a, within a year at the Academy Award. It was just and, and they had uh, done sort of casting exercises just in the schools in New Zealand, all over the country, and they chose her, and she was actually descended from the tribe that this story was about. And, you know, it's another one of those movies that delivers probably the thing that keeps this going for us, that makes you stay in it through the ups and downs, where you intersect with real life. I mean, that entire you know, sort of tribe came over. They actually made Bob a chief in the yeah. tribe. You know what I mean? Right. These are sort of cultural experiences yeah. that are delivered alongside had, that are fantastic. You had to be a chief. There were certain rules. Like I, we had, Before we went to the premiere theater, all these people with huge swords and knives, you know, pointed in my, my in face. In brass dresses. But it, you know, it was, I just, they go, just stand there and don't say anything. You know. um, as, as the business uh, grew, and, the, and I was saying earlier, the studios all got into independent films. Obviously, the comp competition started uh, growing between these indie divisions. And a lot of the budgets of these films started getting bigger and bigger. And they started to resemble studio films. And the marketing costs associated with it started growing as well. So the risk really grew over the years, and the profits declined when these films started going over budget. They, you know, because they're, they're, they're niche films. The niches can be huge, but as the studios started making the films rather than just acquiring them, the business got pretty, pretty rough. And as a result, a few years ago, most of the studios now have moved out of the independent business, concentrating on what we call tentpole releases, making fewer films, but putting a larger bet on each one. So very, very expensive uh, films are, are the order of the day now, which for the Hollywood studios is working with the advent of 3D and these big events. But it's, um, it's now <clears throat> in kind of a different market. We find ourselves in, in starting apparition. Um, you know, the U.S. distribution op options now for films of lower budgets, like 5 to $20 million, have been significantly reduced um, because it's a buyer's market now, and there's, only, there's just a few buyers. So if you're a producer making a film, your options are, are pretty tough if you want to sell your film. Same thing for international European producers that built their budgets up to, to go for the American market. All of a sudden, there's no buyers. And the, the economics of the studios now require, you know, these tentpole pictures. So uh, mid-market distributors such as Lionsgate and Summit are focusing on genre films, horror films, and wide releases. Uh, but audiences, I feel, really want a diverse slate, and they're still out there. I'm going to talk about this one. The producers? Yeah. You know, that. so as a result of this, you know, producers who get in at the beginning to make a movie find it very difficult to get out at the end with any of their investment recouped. Um, I think, do you want to finish up this licensing yeah. or talk about that's where apparition... Well, I, I think the fact that there's fewer buyers and distributors in the market, we see it as an opportunity uh, for, for us as distributors now to... to to buy completed films as one of the few buyers, obviously, it's, it, you know, we can make great deals and, and we can lower our costs too. So at this point, there's a lot of films available for licensing for us. Many have been unable to make deals and some have also raised the marketing money that they can bring into the, to the picture for us to get the film out. So the economics have changed. It's, it's tougher now, but there's more, there is an opportunity in kind of the chaos of the business. And, and I would say that, that deal making has become more creative. You know, it used to be one way that you got a movie made and into theaters, and now there are many options and many people who are driving that business. The other thing that's happened is as the DVD sales have flattened out, just uh, from buying DVDs, which was the simple way 
the studios and, and, and independents used to do it. We would just sell the DVD for one price. The actual sell-through DVDs have declined, but rentals through Netflix, uh, VOD through your cable or phone system, and other forms of streaming are really on the rise. They're more complicated revenue streams, and it hasn't quite made up for the decline in DVD, but it's on the way and balancing. Uh, in the same way that the <clears throat> Internet has provided ways to reduce our marketing cost and find an audience, which we need because we can't compete with the studios on just you know, massive television spins for our movies. So our company requires a smaller overhead, and we kind of do what we do. We, we focus on the theatrical market, um, and we've aligned Apparition with Sony for the, for the DVD, the television, and all the other ancillary sales. So we sell directly to the theaters and keep our overhead down for that and have Sony um, do the rest of it. Um, and a part of this, you know, is that we're able to do this is based on our track record. Because I founded and operated these three successful companies, you know, we have the connections to the talent and the theater owners. Why don't you talk and, about your background? You know, my career's encompassed marketing and publicity jobs at independent companies like Miramax and Savoy and entertainment agencies, including one of the biggest ones, Rogers and Cowan, where I ran the film department and film festivals, including the New York Film Festival for six years. So, you know, what I bring to this table, and this is the first time that Bob and I have ever worked together, is an ability to really drill down and try to maximize and leverage these movies to audiences, to find the audience that will respond to the material and then somehow get it there, always with less money, always relying more on the talent who often become our partners in these arrangements because these are often passion projects. And then just, you know, hoping we have the know-how to, to make sure people know about the movie. After that, you know, it's up to them to go. And, and we have to try to decide which of these projects sometimes become, uh, sometimes these projects become orphans from the studio system. Sometimes they're projects that an actor has wanted to do forever and there's a reason they shouldn't do it and you have to try and discern that you know so many times there's there's a good reason that it's too inside or something but and, uh, the, one of the famous and, ones is with with Hanks if you want to yeah, tell sometimes that. there's no funny reason you know I mean there was this small comedy that was just perceived as damaged goods in Hollywood in fact the company that was set up to release at Lionsgate looked at the finished film and just gave it back to the producers completely let them out of their deal, said we won't release it. You know, Hollywood kind of, the studios looked at it, they didn't want anything to do with it. And so we got a call based on having done some of these difficult movies, you know, Memento or um, things that people didn't think would be easy. Memento was a film that was told backwards. You know, people didn't quite know what to do with that. So the uh, producers set up a screening and put 500 people in there, and we went into the screening. And as the movie started rolling, the audience started laughing and laughing and laughing. And, you know, we kind of felt like, well, maybe half of them could be family and friends and chills, you know, but, <laughs> but not all 500, you know. And, and that movie was my big fat Greek wedding. And, you know... Sometimes it's just seeing the audience, seeing the movie, and using your own gut instinct to say, you know, I think people will be entertained, they will enjoy it. We set out with that movie, we created sort of a careful, small release. We featured Nia Vardalis, who knew, nobody knew, who had written the movie and starred in it, and it went on to be one of the highest grossing independent films. That, that screening where they first showed us the film, they literally were uh, people, you know, were, were falling out of their chairs laughing. And, 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 but, but literally, like this, uh, and it was some older people, and this one woman fell out and broke her hip. She, was <laughs> she really did. And we were like, had to call the ambulance in. And we, so we were like, okay, this is, this is going to work. You know? And when the later, when we, you know, man, it really went against the grain, which is what we do, of the, the Hollywood... <clears throat> says that an, uh, an older audience will not in any way ever go to a movie theater. I mean, that's the standard thinking. 
And on Greek wedding, <clears throat> not only did, did the older aunts go, they went 10 times like teenagers. I mean, they just went over and over, and people just couldn't believe it at the Beekman Theater in Manhattan, where you usually saw skateboards or a bicycle rack, there was like a, a huge stack of walkers. You know, like, okay, this is, this is different. You know? yeah. And <clears throat> same thing happened after that experience. We had uh, how, how we did at Newmarket, my partners had originally uh, funded some early icon films, which is Mel Gibson's production company in Australia. They, they did, <clears throat> I believe it was Hamlet and a couple earlier things. So they had a financial connection. And then on The Passion, no one would release The Passion. The, the studio deals wouldn't, wouldn't even look at it. And uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. how it happened. They, they had, uh, Icon had made the movie. So they put up all the money and essentially hired us to put it out. So they, they showed us the film. And we thought we could do, we could, thought we could make it a very big release, even though it was in subtitled uh, in, in a dead language. <clears throat> and it wasn't, you know, <clears throat> we knew that the critics and everything would be, it wouldn't be easy. <clears throat> but we wanted to make it almost like Braveheart Jesus. So we, we went to Mel and said, we, you have to just go big. And the uh, operationally, it was a big challenge for us. We had uh, 23 people on, in the company. And we went out on 5,000 theaters, so which is equal or bigger than any studio had ever done. So no independent had ever gone this big with the film. And, and all the studios were betting we couldn't even actually do it, like get the copies to the theaters and functionally, operationally do it. So we were really proud of that because it became, and still is, the highest grossing independent film ever. And the, the numbers were just staggering, and, which, and it broke the ceiling. I think it really changed the business of, of how <clears throat> the studios did control the business up to, up to a point and always sort of told producers they couldn't ever break out. Well, actually, we, we grossed just as much and were on less overhead, more <clears throat> profitability, obviously, because of that. So it was, a, it was a really interesting operational phenomenon. One thing that, um, uh, uh, you know, that we found out uh, <clears throat> by that is that the studios also reacted. They, they said, well, if they have 20 people, why do we have, you know, they, most of them had five or 600 doing the same job. Now, admittedly, they did it all the time with bigger movies, but it was very interesting. So that's where we kind of, we always came up through, the, through this business having limited resources and having to be creative about it. So today we run, you know, we, we started up in this market, Apparition. We're backed by Bill Polad. It's a Polad family out of uh, Minneapolis who, uh, they own the Twins, they own several other uh, sports venues and real estate, but their son, one of the sons, Bill, uh, invested in his first film he invested in was Brokeback Mountain, which was a big hit uh, a while ago. And I met him when he made, uh, he was the investor on Prairie Home Companion, which we distributed at Picture House. It was uh, Robert Altman's last film. Um, and he also did Into the Wild. And he had, you know, experience with us on Prairie Home and then Into the Wild with a Hollywood studio with Paramount, and it didn't go so well on that, and that's how we decided to work together. He wanted more control on the films he invested in and wanted to, to have a say in and, and understand the process. And we're, we're uniquely set up to acquire films and also release films produced by Bill and his River Road company. Uh, essentially, we license the films directly to the theaters. We create the marketing materials and develop all the publicity and promotional campaigns. So we're a full-service company that also collects the money from the theater. So uh, as a business, we're the sort of close to the cash, which if you're an outside producer and are waiting for the studio to, you know, the Hollywood studio to report and, and, and give you your share, it can be, you can, it can, you can wait for decades in, as the, uh, in, in the past. So it's... Bill wanted to be in on the, as a distributor and, and on a, in a transparent way. Let's see. You want me to go? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, at Apparition, you know, it, I, I hope that what we've established <coughs> is, you know, that a niche can be large or small. It can be a small New Zealand film or a Christian film about, the, you know, the passion of the Christ. So we're not bound by the size 
of a release or a budget, but instead we like to be set apart as being able to identify with the market and then cleverly figure out what the strategy is to make sure that that potential market knows that the film is in the marketplace. We tend to release films on something called a platform, which really means that instead of going all out, all at once, 2,500 screens, 5,000 screens, we will often create a plan in which we will take a few theaters in one or two towns for a film that might not have any celebrities or you know, might not have a lot of the hooks that you build a campaign on, but instead need to get out there, get the critics behind them. Or we'll take a more of a nationwide kind of platform, 10 cities, instead of the whole country, go a little bit wider in those cities, figure out the campaign there, and then we also have the ability to take the whole country all at once. So each movie gets its own strategy, each movie has a different budget, and each movie has a different set of parameters that you work with, not always money. Sometimes it's the talent you're working with, the director, the producer, all of these elements get uh, put into play as we try to figure out how to get it out there, what cities to open in, how wide. And that, that initial scope, that initial decision on how wide to go is really the risk in the film. In other words, going two theaters, New York and LA, or 10 or wide, uh, that decision's the critical one because you can't really go backwards. If you go too big and it's, and, and it's not successful, you can't start over. So determining that initial scope is, is, and, and the mix of theaters involved is really the, the, the sort of the, the riskiest part and the, and, the, and the part, the decision that has to be made that can affect the profitability of the film. The other thing we've done to, to keep our overhead low and the risk is really uh, sort of outsourced the DVD, pay television, everything to Sony. Uh, that is such a complicated business and high overhead and changing technology that for now uh, we've decided, at least in the startup, to, to partner with the studio. So we're an independently financed company. We make our own decisions, but we have a, a great relationship with a big company, uh, especially with the technology changing. Um, so that, that's, that's a real advantage for us, having the backing of Bill, a solid uh, partner, having a partner in a studio, but having the freedom to pick our own films. One of the first films we started out with was Bright Star, which uh, Jane Campion is the only woman to ever win the Cannes Film Festival <coughs> as a director. Um, and I'll show you a, a trailer of, uh, of that right now. I had such a dream last night. I was floating above the trees, with my lips connected to those of a beautiful figure. Whose lips? Were they my lips? Are you sure you really liked me? Mr. Keats knows he can't like you. He has no living and no income. He was a dreamer. Have you got John Keats's poem? She wants to read it for herself to see if he's an idiot or not. <laughs> she was a realist. All I wear, I've started to design to myself. Bedroom, coat, to do a bit of writing. My stitching has more merit and admirers than your two scribblings put together. And I can make money from it. But every word he wrote inspired the rapture of first love. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness. This fall, from Academy Award winner Jane Campion, comes a romance that would live forever. I get anxious if I didn't see you. When I don't hear from him, it's as if I've died. As if the air is sucked out from my lungs. Mr. Keats is very brilliant. Was it successful? You taught me to love. You never said, only the rich. I must warn you of the trap that you're walking into, John. You'll lose your freedom permanently. For what? 
get the easy movies, you know, a movie about a poet who lived in the early 1800s with a cast of people that were fantastic actors but not really well known. You know, the trailer that you saw is one of the tools that you use to try to entice people to come in to the theater and you can see in that story what we, in that trailer, the story we tried to tell was almost a triangle. Uh, Abby's character is Fanny, Keats is uh, Ben Wishaw's Keats, and then Paul Schneider's Mr. Brown, him being the foil in the story. And um, we had a great success with that movie. It played all over the country. It did super business. And in addition to all of those regular tools, you know, the trailers, the pictures, the showing the film to the critics, which we knew we had because... Jane Campion is such a masterful director, and this is such a beautiful story. You still keep trying to figure out what else, what else, what else can we do? And on this movie, we really tried to get Jane nominated for an Oscar. You know, we really thought if there was going to be a woman to win it, she had already won at Cannes, how could we do that? And so in addition to everything we did for the movie, we really worked sort of the feminist edges of, uh, of a campaign on her behalf. And one of the greatest nights for me was when Gloria Steinem hosted a cocktail party in her apartment in New York. And it was particularly powerful when she got up and introduced not Jane, but all of the women in the room, and there were 50 of them. And then Jane began talking, and you really felt like, you know, this was a powerful group of women and if any of them were voters you know we were going to we were going to get that vote unfortunately it was the year of a woman but they went with more of a studio woman in Catherine Bigelow but i think Jane would have been just as deserving and then to go from the the sublime and important to, to <laughs> kind of the, the a different angle we, there's an, another film we did originally about 10 years ago both of our, our sons Sean and Liam their favorite film ever was this film that you probably never heard of called Boondock Saints, oh, yes. and 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 they, you know, we they watched it so many times when they, when they were twelve that we I think we finally threw it away. We couldn't take it anymore. They would go on vacation. So then um, uh, last year, uh, Sony had made. It took ten years, but they made the sequel to this movie, and they'd showed it to the big studio, and they everyone went like, "What is this?" You know, like but no one had heard of it. Of course. We knew because of our kids. So we, we did uh, this film, and I'm going to show you a trailer just so you know what we're talking about, called Boondock Saints, part two. Easy boys, daddy's work. 
boys love it. And this, going from this, this is Young Victoria, which was nominated for three Oscars this year and won for the costumes. Our Royal Highness Princess Victoria of Kent. So I began to dream of the day when my life would change. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, um, on that one, sometimes you have these great actresses to work with, but on this, on Young Victoria, we had the producer, uh, we, well, we had Martin Scorsese, Graham King, but also Sarah Ferguson that Jeannie had to talk to every day and work with. So, so, so we to work well, for the, tell know, a few stories there. This was a movie that opened in England not very well. <laughs> Not exactly sure why, but it was another movie that they weren't really sure what to do with. And, you know, we looked at it and we thought it really played and it really delivered and that audiences would really like it. But, you know, Emily Blunt is a very busy actress, very in demand, very unavailable. So we didn't really have the luxury of having her do everything, but it occurred to us that Sarah Ferguson who is the Duchess of York, was really the true story. She had lived in the castle when she was married to Prince Andrew. She had gone through Victoria's uh, diaries. She had come up with the idea of telling the story of her at this age because she felt that that had never been portrayed. Everyone saw her as the, you know, all in black and dour. And, you know, she really wanted to show this young girl that she was reading about. And so we actually used Sarah Ferguson and her daughters, the princesses, to go around the country and do interviews, do appearances. And they were a sensation. And um, I think it really helped the movie. Yeah. And I'll just show you a quick trailer. So we want to leave time for yeah. questions. Well, a quick trailer of The Runaways, which is out now. This is the, the, uh, the story of Joan Jett and Cherie Curry in the 70s when they started the first girl rock band. My name is Cherie, and my life was ready for a change. It really looks terrible. Good. It all started with Joan. Joan Jett. Mercury Actors. We got signed. Crimson Clover. The Runaways had the most chance of 
any group I've seen to tear this world apart. So this movie's in theaters now. This movie's been amazing I'm gonna, because it's... I'm going to uh, fast forward this. It's forward. Um, real people and then real actresses, real history. You know, a, a director saying, I didn't make a documentary, I made a feature film. You know, it's just been really an interesting um, challenge with all those players. This one is a, a film that's coming out in Manhattan this week called The Square. It's Australian, two brothers, kind of like the Coen brothers, the Edgerton brothers, who made a, a film noir. Reminded me, when I first saw it, of the film uh, Blood Simple. Hey, my Once it's done, you walk it away. Never happened. We never met. Definitely give you a few jolts. Uh, you you distribute. You said there were five thousand theaters in America. Well, there's, no, there's about thirty thousand. But we what I was referred to five thousand was the one film that we went out on five thousand at one time compared to the. Uh, how, did, how did the distribution rights work for the thirty thousand? Are there six people or? 20,000, or how do you reach all these? There are, most of the, um, most of the distributors are now consolidated into about six companies. Uh, so there's six major ones, and then a, a, a smattering of independent ones that sometimes have a buyer, uh, some kind of a co-op buyer, and there's some individual ones. But for the most part, we're dealing with a consolidated group of theater owners. Circuits. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was just curious as to how the earlier independents, ones when we were kids, say like uh, Frank and Eleanor Perry, David Lee, or Jacques Tati, which you do all that kind of stuff, how did they, their experiences compare with yours? Was it easier, harder? I mean, just one about that. The other question I had was what when videotape hit, then they, did that open up a lot more opportunities? Mm -hmm. did, did it, can everyone hear the question? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I don't know how Jack Tati. Fits. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm I, certainly yeah. a fan. I, yeah, well, absolutely. Well, I think I think those those directors absolutely. like uh, Tati and Truffaut and everything. It's it's interesting because their experience as far as the U.S. market was was tricky. No one uh, people one of the one of the distributors that did those early films was Roger Corman, who was considered the king of the B movie here. But one but he loved those movies and he would buy the rights to those movies for nothing and then. Many of them made a fortune, right, over in, over over here. And uh, the the Jacques Tati or Truffaut probably never saw any of. The, they probably had no idea. Like it's 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 really interesting in those days, and it was very rough. The uh, some of the uh, the the real independent uh, directors back then never, you know, never got their films in theaters, or they'd be like a in Manhattan maybe. So it was tough. And one of the first theater owners was Dan Talbot, who has the Lincoln Plaza Cinemas on Broadway, and. He's still the, 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 one of the few independent theater owners that will give these films a chance and let them play. 
So it was very tough. But the climate was a little different then because, you know, first of all, there weren't as many independent movies in the U.S., so those foreign films really nurtured kind of an audience that wanted good films, and then critics would actually champion those films, and critics then really set the agenda for all the people that went to these theaters. And at the same time, instead of having six buyers, you had more independent theaters all across the country. And the, the VCR, the VHS, made a huge impact, followed by DVD, that actually gave us a financial safety net for the expense of the theatrical marketing place, which is true today and why it's so tough today. Um, often the marketing for the theatrical release does not recoup, uh, and you're recouping from the ancillary DVD or television. And as the VHS and DVD grew in the 80s and 90s, it, it, it made all this possible. Now with the changing technology, um, we're in this uh, you know, rockier period where, the, where it was shift, but the new digital technology could be yet another uh, boon, just like VHS or DVD. Each time the movies have been recycled into a different format and generated you know, more money. Nancy. It's really, no, we don't. We control it by um, how good of a job we do in preparing the film. But once a film gets out, it's really up to the audience. If the film, it's very tough. If a film's working, if there's an audience, like Young Victoria is still playing. It played 16 weeks. So if the word of mouth is there, and it's good, but it's all on that sort of Monday morning, the theater owners come in and look at all their screens, and you know, if you're the low one, you're, you're done. You know, so it's very tough. So it really, the word, no matter what we do, we need to pick films that we really believe the word of mouth is going to carry it because the longer the films play, that's where our profit is. Mm -hmm. right. And then, you know, we've also, like, hopefully have the record with those exhibitors so we can get a movie in mm -hmm. because there's a lot of competition to even try to get a screen. We'll get the extra shot, you know, because of our track record and because of our relationships. So we can get favors to a certain point, but you can't keep something on that's not really working. This uh, gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to get a little better idea of the movie business in general. So using my big fat Greek wedding as an example, which probably everybody knows. From A to Z, I mean, somebody made that film. Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. just because they read the book, and then, and then where does apparition get involved? I mean, somebody, are you guys from the very beginning, or, or are you a letter M or something along the way? Well, it, 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 it varies, and that one we came in in, in the middle, so to speak. So that movie uh, was financed by HBO, and uh, Tom Hanks has a great relationship with HBO, and his wife produced the film. So it was originally done, I would say, as favor, you know, to Tom's wife. And then they made the film, showed it to HBO, and everyone went, yeah, you know, it's okay. You know, like, uh, and then went to Tom and his wife. They went, that's very nice, you know. And then they had a partner selling a called Gold Circle Films that sold the international rights. So the rights were divided. The value of the international rights is uh, increased if it has a theatrical release in the U.S. It's it's more valuable internationally. So that company went to Tom. So we, we this should go out in theaters. They went to HBO, who said. You know, we already did the favor making it. We don't want to spend money putting it out. They were, they were almost embarrassed by the film. They didn't get it. So the Gold Circle, the international company, said, we'll raise the money and hire and work with, at the time, we were IFC Films. So we came in then. That's when Tom Hanks showed us the movie. Everybody's falling out of their seats. And we're like, yes. You know. So they put up the money. Uh, and to, to make this happen, uh, HBO actually had to give up their pay rights, even though they made the movie, and, and go back to a formula like it was from an outside studio and pay based on the, the theatrical success of the film, which they believed would be zero, right? So they ended up having to buy back their own movie wow. at a huge price. And, and the movie um, made the, most of the money in the theatrical profit went to Gold Circle, you know, because they were they put up the 
theatrical risk money, and no one thought it would work. So they're con you know everyone was assuming it wouldn't work. So they got a great deal. Ultimately, uh, the producers and Nia and everybody got bonuses through that. But it, it's a very strange uh, way that that happened. You know, it was very much an orphaned project in many ways of the, of the films we've worked on because you know we work in an opportunistic environment that's how a lot of our films have, have have been they've been orphaned and we've seen a certain value and come at it from a different perspective who finances i'm sorry Dominic. who finances the beginning i mean uh, in that in that, that film Hanks, right? well there's, and, there's no Tom Hanks well Hanks. then it's in many cases on these uh, on these independent films it's it's private equity it's it's an investor uh, Yes, uh, or it's split rights. Uh, a lot of times you'll have an international company will put up 40% and an investor will put up equity. And you can also find uh, a lot of so soft money. If you're doing a film that has international appeal, uh, if you're doing a film particularly in Europe, there's a lot of uh, funds and local funds, or even in Canada, provincial funds, state, a lot of government money in Europe and Canada will go into these films and and in equity investors can from the US can participate and take take advantage of that. And in the plaid shirt? <coughs> I was wondering, is it possible to make a three D movie like as an independent movie? That's a good question. Oh yes, absolutely. I mean the technology, the cost of these uh, of the three D cameras and rigs and everything are going way down uh, every day. I mean, we looked you know, at... No, Avatar and, was 10 years, but yeah. now you could probably make it in yeah, two. Yeah. We looked at... We wanted to do... We still made this uh, really great documentary on elephants in Kenya and stuff, and even as we were looking at it over the past three years, the cost has gone down 50%, and, and just... So it's, it's, it's actually possible, and I think with the... What's going to make it really possible is the conversion of all the theater screens, because now... There's not enough screen, so that if you have a couple big blockbusters and you have an independent, it'll be tougher to get in today. Um, in 18 months, every screen will be 3D, and so it, it is possible. Yes. Yes. So I don't know, should we uh, keep going? Yeah, or? Yeah. Yes? I yes. think we've got another five. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. so we we'll start with uh, you. You mentioned that uh, the big Hollywood movies cost a lot of money. I want to know, what is it that really costs money? If you look at the old films, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, you had scripts, you had writers, you had actors who had a lot of actors with speaking roles, and now they're unionized. You don't have that now. You have technology, you have noise, music, animation. So what is it that costs so much money nowadays? Well, it's, it, is, it is the actors. I mean, they still, the top actors demand huge amounts in the, in the studio films, and these effects films in 3D the, the technology is hugely expensive. Um, a lot of times it's the, the expense, like on Avatar, went into developing the technology, which is part of it. So it, it's also completely inflated by the whole system. You know, the, the, the agencies, the, the studios, it, it has gotten out of control. Uh, and, and there's been a movement back, you know, to try to reduce the cost and, and that's been the success of these independent films where the actors do it for a back end and, and the film I couldn't show you anything because we can't figure it out but Terry Malick we have Brad Pitt and Sean Penn who did it they didn't take their salary but they will take the, the, the back end profits if, if there are any so they're, they're more taking the risk with us but it, but it is out of control like you, you hear these budgets and you, you can't believe it and there's no way they can make it back among these films Well, we've had, uh, well, we've had, we've had, there's always disappointments, you know, and um, e even, even to a certain degree, uh, even though it performed pretty well and got critical range, I, I was hoping that Bright Star would, would catch on with a younger audience and we'd have a resurgence of letter writing and poetry. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, you, but you kind of, uh, again, as Jeannie said, each project is, is its own one, and that's what I like about the business because the independent business, because it's not a cookie cutter thing, it's not a formula. We really look at each film and try to put it together. And it's like putting on a big show. It's like a Broadway show. You do all this work, 
you come up to opening night and then you, you see what happens. Yeah, there was a young lady here. Um, Uh, occasionally, we, we, it's not like, we have a say on certain films depending on when they're brought to us. Um, like on, uh, if they come in the middle and we, we can recommend certain things. Um, some directors, very few have ultimate final cut. One of, one of those directors is Terrence Malick. So on the Tree of Life that we're working on now, we can, Jeannie and I have, you know, seen the picture, we offer comments really respectfully, you know, because <laughs> in the end of the day, he has final cut, and he's going to do whatever he wants. Yeah. I think in the back. Yeah. I've read that some financing is raised through pre-sales, and I was wondering if you could talk about what that is, and is it a feasible route for you to well, pencil? Yeah, well, uh, uh, pre-sales have been the tradition of going to Cannes or the AFM or these markets, and having the elements put together, the director, the cast, sometimes the poster, and getting individual distributors and territories in France and UK to, to commit to buying the film for a certain amount of money. Uh, then you can bank those commitments and then try and finance the rest of it. What's happened though over the past five years is, I would say five, the pre-sale market has just tanked and it's become very difficult. A lot of the companies that were doing that, you know, overstretched, you know, bought too many films. So there's been a real retraction in the pre-sale market. So for an independent film, it's very difficult. It's, it's possible for the top studio films or the top films with actors, like Tree of Life, because Brad agreed to do it, we could pre-sale. But without an actor or a famous, a really top director, for an independent film, it's become very, very difficult. And that's been one of the issues in financing. I mean, it, that, that, that market, along with just the, you know, the, the conditions of the past two years, have really, really made it difficult to, to pre-sell a film. Yes? You mentioned that there are six major distributors mm -hmm. in the United States, which sounds to some extent like a prescription for homogeneity. I suppose yeah. they have, each of them has a piece that they're willing to put into independent films. Is there a lot of diversity between those six companies in terms of what they like? Because I presume you're competing for their uh, attention or trying to go around. Well, I would say, well, with the, with the big companies, uh, I think what, what really there's, there's very little diversity, which, um, you know, they're, they're, they're risking so much that that has to be a film just like something else. Um, and, and of course, you have these breakouts like Avatar, you know, some new technology. So I think our advantage is to try to, to not compete with them in a way, to come up with something, uh, an, an audience that we feel is underserved, and go for that. Uh, like I mentioned in Greek Wedding, since they believe that no older audience would go, we would try to find that. Or, uh, you know, uh, look at um, uh, African American films or, or some segment that we're not competing because we don't have the resources to directly compete. So we try to we try to use diversity as a as a tool to, to succeed. Well, ultimately, you need to get into it. <laughs> well, the, when when she was talking about the the six, she was talking about the big studio systems. The theaters are separate. The theater chains are totally open to our type of films because they they have too many screens. Essentially, if you build a thirty screen complex, as is the thing. There's, there, lately, there's been room, which is, that's been a really good thing for us. There's the, in, the, in, the, in the exhibition in the theaters, there's room for these films more than ever because Hollywood has cut back the number of films they're making to these bigger tent poles, giving us more access to the theaters. So we only can take one more, Richard, and then maybe we can talk after. Um, the first two apparitions were about uh, Ritz, which is obviously a brilliant way to not Exactly. <laughs> yeah. well, of all the ingredients that you look at, how important is like the mood of the nation or the psychology of the nation of, of the time that you can be movie at? Like the recession now, people want feel good movies and things happen. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Yeah. I'm talking. Oh, I think so. Uh, well, I think it definitely helped on the Young Victoria. The Young Victoria is a really crowd pleasing, upbeat, fun movie with a kind of lively performances all around. And I think. That really was why it worked. It really kind of stood out against. It's it's tougher now. I mean, you can find examples if you look at uh, Precious that came out 
that is a tough, dark, you know, bleak story with maybe some glimmer of hope at the end. But I think it was, for a lot of people, it was like, all right, it's the weekend, go to a movie. It, it, it was a tough thing. I mean, I'm glad it, it did quite well. It did $50 million. But um, I think generally the, 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 the movies that have done well in the, in the kind of downturn have been the upbeat films and more positive. Yeah. Well, I would like to close by thanking you so much. Oh, you're welcome. For Thank you. Entertaining. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. You managed to entertain us and inform, and uh, we are very grateful to you.